I hope everybody on I hope everybody on Zoom can hear me. We had some technical uh, dif difficulties this morning, and I'm completely disoriented because we're like perpendicular in direction in the room than we normally are. Um, so sorry for the delay. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, Pediatric Grand Rounds. It's uh, a great honor to uh, welcome our speaker today, uh, who is a long-standing friend and colleague uh, of many of us, uh, not just me here uh, in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, and uh, before I introduce her, uh, let me also apologize that um, you will probably, if you're on Zoom, not be able to see her or me. You will see the audience eating lunch because this uh, alternative configuration doesn't allow us to have a, my, a, um, uh, a camera focused on the speaker. But I can assure you, Dr. Natalie Giov Giovanovic looks like a... Um, established researcher in her field and is uh, uh, dressed up as a speaker for Grand Rounds, uh, behooves to be dressed up in, uh, uh, and it's just lovely to be, uh, to have her here. So let me tell you a little bit about her in case you don't know her. Um, Dr. Uh, Natalie Jovanovic is actually a pediatric intensive care physician. She taught me everything I know about pediatric critical care. I trained under her. Um, she primarily um, um, practices at the Children's Hospital in Oakland, uh, where she's been on uh, faculty for uh, decades now. She uh, did her um, uh, medical school training at Duke, Duke University, then went to the uh, University of Utah to do her residency, was a chief resident there, and did her pediatric critical care fellowship uh, there. She, after that, came to the Bay Area, joined the Children's Hospital um, of Oakland there, and uh, functions as the medical director of the pediatric intensive care uh, unit, uh, and also is the, I need to make sure I have the titles correctly, is it on here? Um, it's not on here. Yeah, I was just going to say, there's something else. So she's the medical staff president uh, uh, for Oakland. So um, she also is a phenomenal researcher, has done decades of uh, research focusing on uh, sepsis, nutrition, early mobility. And she's particularly very interested in uh, what, what makes it so that some kids come in with an infection and end up in their ICU really, really sick, and some kids don't seem to be affected to the same degree. And uh, we always ask our grand round speakers to tell us, like, how did you get to this topic? And she says, having been fascinated with molecular biology in its early days, but choosing to focus on clinical medicine, the opportunity to participate in bench to bedside to bench research was very appealing. The evolution of the genomics project as hypothesis generating with the goal of providing personalized medicine and directly impacting the lives of children was very appealing. So without further ado, Dr. Jovanovic. Wow, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, unfortunately, I have to sit down for this talk, so um, I'm going to get started here. Um, but good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you a little bit about my career and the clinical research I've been fortunate to participate in. Um, I gave a slightly abbreviated version of this talk in pediatric research conference for the um, PICU fellows, and um, no good deed goes unpunished. And so Sandrine said, oh, hey, could you do a grand rounds on this? So um, being poor at saying no by that you can tell by the many hats I wear, um, I agreed. So uh, stay tuned for a little bit of background, some science, some advice, and some thanks. And along the way, you'll see how even a meandering pathway can lead to an interesting career. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so the objectives of this are a little bit loose, but uh, I'm just going to describe sort of my path to uh, how I got where I am now. And along the way, I'll talk a little bit about the application of precision medicine to pediatric sepsis, which is sort of the, the coolest part of the work that I've been able to participate in. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. And anybody who knows me well knows that I love the Princess Bride. And uh, this is Inigo Montoya, who says he's going back to the beginning. And I'll spare you from playing the clip because I'm not sure it's going to work. <laughs> anyway, I started off uh, actually in, in uh, high school and you heard a little bit of my, of my um, path, but I really wanted to be a molecular biologist and a cancer researcher and being 
um, not very ambitious. I thought I would find the cure for cancer in my career. Um, and so I spent some time in, uh, in high school, uh, not in high school, in uh, college, and then also in medical school doing some molecular biology research. And it was at a time when, when the field was really um, in, its, in its beginnings. But it turned out that I actually didn't like bench work all that much. And I also liked people more than I thought I did. And uh, so I proceeded to go on to medical school at Duke, and um, and then I decided I wanted to prove a point. And um, I was a woman in medical school in this was in the late '80s, early '90s, and uh, female surgeons weren't all that common, and female successful surgeons weren't all that common. And I had already decided that I didn't want to be a medical oncologist, but I thought maybe I could be a surgical oncologist and cut the cancer out. So I proceeded to match in general surgery. And uh, I spent two years at the University of Utah, which was really, really interesting. I got a lot of trauma experience. I got a lot of critical care experience. And as surgical interns and second year residents, we ran around unsupervised, causing all sorts of trouble and cleaning up after ourselves with not a lot of input. So I learned a ton. And, uh, you know, good judgment comes from bad experiences. So. <laughs> I have a lot of good judgment. Um, anyway, with time, I realized that uh, I loved the medical aspect of the work that I was doing, and I uh, loved the children's hospital and the atmosphere in the children's hospital, and I uh, decided to change careers and go into pediatrics. So I proceeded to tell the chief of pediatric surgery at Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah, an elderly Mormon gentleman, that I was changing to pediatrics. And I got a really backhanded compliment in response. He said, oh, that's too bad. You're too smart to be a pediatrician. <laughs> so I said, thank you and moved on. <laughs> um, so I went on to do uh, my pediatric residency and, uh, and fellowship. And, um, and here I am. So um, I completed my fellowship at Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake, which is a busy unit. And there I carried out my fellow research projects. And I had had no experience at all in the field of epidemiology, but I was, had some interest in injury. And at the University of Utah, there was the Intermountain Injury Control Research Center that was run by Mike Dean, who's one of the sort of pioneers of critical care and an incredibly smart person. And he had put together this team of um, uh, injury researchers that included faculty, statisticians, um, trauma systems, and the, this group was involved with uh, statistics and epidemiology of injury and um, its relation to advocacy. And so my particular fellow projects included assessment of teen driver risk, which at the time was used to inform graduated driver licensing laws um, across the country. So, you know, for example, finding out that especially 17 year old boys driving with passengers in the car are much more likely to be stupid and do something reckless. In case you didn't already know that, we had the data to prove that. So, so that was um, that was actually pretty fun work to be involved in, and the advocacy especially was interesting. I, I also um, uh, did a project looking at ATV injuries in kids because in the ICU I took care of a number of kids who were uh, uh, injured because they were riding around on ATVs, and in particular, I remember a four-year-old who uh, had been thrown off an ATV. And he, of course, wasn't helmeted. And guess who was driving his AT the ATV that he was on? You might guess an older sibling, but no, it was his grandmother. <laughs> the other grandmother was not pleased with this grandmother. Anyway, um, <laughs> I looked at the ATV injuries in the state of Utah and um, in relationship to age. And again, this, this took... Uh, the form of um, advocacy for the legislature to um, uh, do some helmet legislation for, for kids with ATVs and also to uh, establish that three-wheel ATVs, which were pretty common at the time, were really unstable and so on. So it was kind of a fun path, but I didn't really know a ton about it. For the ATV work, I was very proud to get the dumb quote of the month from ATV magazine, and that was that children and ATVs don't mix well. And just looking at this uh, or doing uh, some pre-work for this talk, 
I looked back at some of the emails and letters I got from people following that quote, and um, they were kind of amazing, mostly negative. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so so that was my fellow work, and um, and I had some interest in ongoing research. And so when I finished a fellowship, I was luck lucky enough to be able to go on to um, uh, a job here at the Children's Hospital in Oakland, which was um, freestanding at the time. And um, despite my relative inexperience in clinical research, I was really able to uh, help carry on and continue to grow the already quite successful clinical research program that had been established there. My first task as junior faculty was to be the site PI for the prone positioning study in pediatric ARDS, which many of you are familiar with. But that was a trial whose background work, design, and implementation um, many here at UCSF were significant contributors to. I would say that being a site PI for a multi-center study is a really great introduction to the world of clinical research. And if any of you have the opportunity to do so, you know, jump at it. Um, but always being mean and lean in Oakland um, meant that I was involved in every aspect of the project from laminating charts of ideal body weight to uh, evaluating um, adverse events, steering committee meetings, manuscript writing. It was really an invaluable opportunity to get to know people across the country and also to start to understand the incredible collaboration that's required to carry out clinical research, particularly in the world of pediatric critical care. It was a great learning experience. And again, uh, I wouldn't be where I was without um, having those opportunities. So fast forward to 2003, Dr. Hector Wong was invited to give grand rounds. At the time, Dr. Wong was still a fairly junior faculty at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where he was doing really interesting work on the pathophysiology of pediatric sepsis. At that grand rounds, he spoke about what was then the novel world of genomics and gene, genome level analysis. As those of you who were fortunate enough to hear him present his work know, he was a really great storyteller. And I was pretty hooked after those grand rounds. And uh, thanks to my colleagues, Jim Hansen and Heidi Flory, I got to be the site PI for what was to become a body of research that significantly enhanced our knowledge of the pathophysiology of pediatric septic shock and has made personalized or precision medicine a tangible reality. It started off being called the genomics of SIRS. So going into the foundational work for this research platform, the first iteration assessed the genomic expression patterns in pediatric septic shock. We developed a national level genomic data bank and uh, collected RNA um, from whole blood DNA and serum samples from kids under 10 years of age. We had normal healthy children as controls. They were kids who were getting TNAs done or cardiac caths or you know, blood drawn for other reasons um, and compared them to kids who had systemic inflammatory response syndrome and everything on that spectrum all the way to severe sepsis and septic shock. We measured gene expression patterns at the level of the entire genome by microarray analyses. And again, at the time, this was quite novel. I'm not going to bore you with all the uh, detail of the applications, but there's an alphabet soup of data collection and analysis tools that were used. Importantly, this was by definition a hypothesis generating approach that was evaluating the entire human genome with no pre hoc biases toward expected physiologic pathways. Any gene that showed up that it was differentially regulated could have been of importance. So it was also very practical from a clinical research standpoint, um, allowing for enrollment and sample collection within a feasible but biologically relevant time period. So the initial approximations came from 42 children who had septic shock, of whom nine were non-survivors. It was not surprisingly a heterogeneous cohort, and we focused on day one within 24 hours of ICU admission. The first major presentation of preliminary results was at the NIH during the third Functional Genomics and Critical Illness and Injury Symposium in April 2005. Here's Hector presenting the data. I had the good fortune of being there for the conference and the presentations at Hector's suggestion. The symposium was sponsored by the NIH, and given the illness and injury in the title, the, the attendees were some of my former prior life colleagues, trauma surgeons, adult and uh, pulmonary critical care. Uh, medicine um, uh, specialists and uh, PhDs. And Hector and I were definitely the only pediatricians in the audience. And I probably noticed it somewhat then, but 
I don't think there were a lot of women in the audience besides me. And there were certainly not a lot of Cuban Americans of Chinese descent like Hector. So um, I noticed it actually when I was uh, looking back at this and watching the video and it panned the audience and it was really striking that it was just an, an audience of um, all white men. So as I look around the room and having worked here now for, for through the decades, um, it's really uh, nice to see that demographic change, but obviously we still have lots of work to be done. This was a pretty challenging environment to present this data, which was quite novel. And um, But Hector argued both the relevance of findings in pediatrics, but also in the relevance of the work to the broader adult community. And also the importance of having a real hypothesis generating approach rather than what was the traditional hypothesis driven approach. There was the potential to discover new ad avenues, not only for therapeutic interventions, but also for risk stratification and allocation to studies, most likely to provide a favorable risk benefit ratio for enrolled subject. This has become to be termed predictive and prognostic enrichment. And I'll uh, explain that a little bit more for anybody who's not familiar. Back to the results of this initial work, it made pretty pictures for one, um, but this figure shows the level of expression of 2,482 genes that were differentially regulated between children with septic shock and controls. Each vertical column corresponds to an individual subject and each horizontal segment corresponds to an indiv individual gene. Red demonstrates overexpression relative to controls and blue is underexpression. You don't have to be very familiar with this method to see that there's a fairly clear demarcation be between controls and septic shock patients. And I don't know if you can see the pointer here, but on the left-hand side are the controls. They're mostly yellow because that's sort of considered to be the baseline. And on the left, on the right are the septic shock patients. It turned out that the group of genes that are blue or underexpressed contained a large number of genes that directly depend on zinc homeostasis or play a direct role in zinc homeostasis. Based on these findings, we retrospectively measured serum zinc levels in these patients, and this is what we found. Here you see the zinc levels of survivors on the left, non-survivors on the right. This difference was statistically significant. This was a retrospective analysis of the samples that we already had. These zinc levels were, were measured from samples that had been collected in tubes that were not intended for measurement for zinc. It turns out that you have to have metal-free tubes for that. But nevertheless, the results were intriguing. One of the relatively unexpected findings in this initial cohort was that genes for several isoforms of metallothionine were differentially expressed among the patients. MT is a small, evolutionarily conserved cysteine-rich protein that is best known as an early stress response gene with heavy metal binding and antioxidant properties. In this original cohort of patients, MT expression appeared to be a biomarker for poor outcome. This was corroborated in Hector's lab with real-time PCR shown here. Again, on the left, you see normal controls. The two middle um, uh, lanes are survivors and the two far right lanes where the MT1G and MT1H expression is significantly higher are the non-survivors. Our preliminary conclusions from this work were that genome level, level differentiation of pediatric patient subgroups with SIRS and septic shock reveals clinical differences and that differential expression of five and, and diff differential expression of five major gene networks. Specifically, non-survivors of pediatric septic shock have a distinct gene expression profile that's most notable for high level expression of several isoforms of the intracellular zinc binding protein metallothionine. They display high level expression of interferon gamma and failure to activate many genes related to zinc homeostasis or that are zinc dependent. They have depressed serum zinc levels compared with survivors, which is consistent with increased MT expression. Based on these preliminary data, we developed a hypothesis describing a potentially lethal cascade of events. We dubbed it the death phenotype in pediatric septic shock, which might be a little overly dramatic. <laughs> but it starts with a stimulus for septic shock, which leads to hyperexpression of MT genes which we thought might be mediated by empty promoter polymorphisms, bacterial specific factors, comorbidities, and any manner of unknown host factors. 
This leads to a pathologic tissue sequest sequestration of zinc and a hyperacute zinc deficiency and altered zinc related biological processes. We thought these might be mediated or exacerbated by alterations in zinc homeostasis genes. All this dysfunction ultimately could lead to death, which might be modified by coordinately expressed or repressed candidate genes like interferon gamma or heat shock protein. So of course, we needed to look at this a little bit more. So based on these preliminary data, uh, we decided to look into the zinc and metallothionine story a little bit more deeply. It so happened that at the um, Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute down the road from the main hospital resided one of the world's experts in zinc metabolism, Dr. Janet King. She's a um, PhD biochemist and has done um, a lot of work in maternal uh, nutrition and, and, feed, and the impact of zinc deficiency on fetuses, as well as the impact of zinc deficiency on children in developing countries. But she was the perfect collaborator for this, uh, for this project. So um, Heidi Flory, who was the, um, my partner in crime at the time, she's now at the University of Michigan, a pediatric intensivist. Hector Wong and Janet and I developed a pilot study to look prospectively at zinc and MT levels and their association with critical illness. We wanted to test the uh, hypotheses that changes in MT expression and tissue redistribution of zinc are common in critical illness, and also that these processes are associated with the degree of organ failure. We enrolled 25 critically ill children, which we defined as children with a PRISM score or a pediatric risk of mortality score greater than five, and or one or more new organ failures on admission. We sampled on day one and day three, sort of to mirror the genomic work that had been done before. We measured plasma zinc and copper levels. Copper was a, a sort of a negative control as another trace element. We looked at uh, complete metabolic panels. We measured ferritin as a measure of inflammation and CRP as well. We looked at whole blood MTR, uh, metallothionine mRNA expression, as well as expression of a whole variety of cytokines that you see there. And just because Hector was near and dear to my heart, I'll share a little Hectorism with you, um, which is actually good to keep in mind as you uh, develop your clinical research career. I was complaining about trying to figure out how to uh, determine whether somebody was eligible within the criteria that we had uh, decided. And he said, you go to the bedside with the criteria you have, not the criteria you wished you have. And that was adapted from Donald Rumsfeld, who those of you who are old enough know. <laughs> may have had a quote that was similar. Anyway, uh, once to the, the study had started, um, we were able to prospectively uh, va validate the finding that plasma zinc levels are low in critically ill children, with normal zinc levels being around 75 micrograms per deciliter, or that dotted white line that you see on the left-hand box there. And uh, the, the blue lines are on, or the blue bars are day one of um, sampling and uh, the purple bars are on day three. So the, the zinc levels stayed persistently low day one and day three, whereas copper levels changed a little bit, but were within normal limits. Looking at the relationship between zinc and CRP and IL-6, we found that the zinc levels correlated inversely with C-reactive protein levels in the graph on the left, and with IL-6 levels in the graph on the right, those IL-6 levels are log transformed. We also found that uh, zinc levels uh, correlated with organ failure on day three, which you can see here. The blue bars, again, are um, patients who had one or fewer organs that failed, and the purple bars are two or more organs that failed. So on day three, the patients who were sicker with more persistent organ failure also had persistently low zinc levels. Zinc levels also correlated with some of the MT isoforms on day one, specifically MT1A and MT1G and 1H. Now in the original work, the 
uh, RNA expression that I showed you earlier referred to MT1G and 1H levels that were highly overexpressed in the non-survivors. The MT1F expression correlated with the risk of mortality score. Again, this is day one data. Looking at day three though, that correlation went away and there was no correlation of MT expression with organ failure on day one or day three. So we speculated that enhanced metallothionine expression early in acute stress and the associated decline in plasma zinc may contribute to the subsequent inflammatory response and risk of organ failure in critically ill children. So what's the next step? Well, of course, an R01 is the logical next step, right? We uh, came up with all sorts of names for our trial, which was quite fun because all of us had a pretty good sense of silliness. And uh, we came up with zinc ameliorates pediatric lymphopenia and improves glucose control, which of course is a mouthful, but it translates to zaplic. The reviewers apparently weren't all that impressed. <laughs> so um, apart from, uh, from the um, lack of credibility on my part with uh, my lack of clinical research experience and funding, um, even for Hector, who already had a significant body of work, um, there, was, there was more work to be done. So we, oh, sorry, let's see. Um, uh, they also expressed a significant concern um, for uh, the safety of zinc, which was fair. So we moved on to a phase two study of um, IV zinc supplementation. We were fortunate enough to get an intramural grant from the uh, Children's Hospital Oakland and proceeded with a stepwise dose escalation study. We again enrolled critically ill children younger than 10 years of age. And by the way, the 10 year sort of demarcation was to try to um, take out children who may be on the verge of puberty and any effects that they that that may occur um, that that may um, result in of course it's a you know it's it's a spectrum but um, that was the the basis for that we again looked at um, critically ill kids with uh, prism greater than five or more than more than uh, one new organ failure we were able to add a collaborator from the Cincinnati uh, Children's Clinical Pharmacology section, Dr. Sander Vinks, and he was able to model pharmacokinetics with as few as six patients per dosing group. So we had four dosing groups, starting with uh, nosing supplementation, 250 mics per kilo per day, 500, and then 750 mics per kilo per day. We did PK sampling at defined intervals for each uh, dosing group. Uh, we also measured IL-6, CRP, and um, uh, lymphocyte subsets, as well as serial glucose measurements, because uh, zinc has some influence on glucose regulation. At the end of each uh, of enrolling each group, so each of the six uh, patients in the study, we did the pharmacokinetic modeling um, uh, prior to advancement of each dose in order to make sure that the zinc levels were not just going crazy. And here you can see the levels and the, um, let's see if I can get this going here because it'll be easier. Uh, I don't know. Um, the, uh, the, the dosing level that is uh, demarcated by the solid triangles is the 500 micrograms per kilo per day. The one that zigzags all over the place and goes up above the normal levels is the 750 mic per kilo per day. So based on this modeling, uh, it looked like 500 mics per kilo per day dosing uh, divided TAD, which is what we did, nearly restored plasma zinc levels without inducing prolonged periods of time with zinc levels above normal. We found no difference in inflammatory markers, but remember that this was only in 24 kids and this was not intended to, to address the efficacy question. Uh, there was no difference in episodes of hyperglycemia. Um, no children had any adverse events, and all of the kids had progressive decrease in PLOD, which is a measurement of um, number of organs that are uh, not functioning well over time. We concluded that the IV zinc at 500 mics per kilo per day was safe and restored plasma zinc levels to the near the 50th percentile. And we also concluded, obviously, that a multicenter trial like 
every phase two trial concludes, <laughs> is the next step. However, we were at a fork in the road. <laughs> I had to crack myself up with this, but nobody else was. My husband didn't think it was funny. Um, <laughs> anyway, so what happened next was, was um, you know, a good mentor helps you pivot. And we didn't have the bandwidth or infrastructure to carry out the next step, much to our disappointment. Um, but the genomics project continued, and I continued to be site PI for the ensuing years. It's really been the gift that keeps on giving, and uh, I've been incredibly fortunate to be a part of it. It's been a fascinating evolution of findings that have informed sepsis care in both adults and children, and I'm going to pivot a little bit to uh, talking about that. So there, there's no doubt that clinical research is challenging, and particularly, particularly in pediatrics. They make up a small proportion of the population and, of course, are relatively healthy at baseline. They are, like all humans, an homogeneous group. There are ethical concerns around research in children as a vulnerable population. There are time constraints, particularly in critical care research, that add to the challenge. So we're left with the question of how can we take a really good idea that seems to make sense and make it as applicable as possible and make the study as, as uh, efficient as possible. One example is the optimal treatment of septic shock. And whether it's pediatric or otherwise, the question of, of how to treat patients with septic shock uh, in the most sophisticated way remains largely unanswered. There've been lots and lots of studies, but we're essentially left with fluid resuscitation, antibiotics, and supportive care, and a sprinkling of hope. I'm gonna say that some hope is provided by the potential for these um, personalized medicine uh, um, studies by using enrichment strategies when designing clinical trials. So this is a cartoon version of um, prognostic and predictive enrichment. Prognostic enrichment is defined by a selection of patients who are at a higher risk for a particular disease outcome, for example, death. Importantly, this is independent of any treatment. In this figure, the baseline population is a heterogeneous cohort of patients with the same condition. Rather than treating the entire cohort similarly, the subjects are first stratified into low versus high risk based on their baseline prognosis. The low risk patients uh, who are the light blue and yellow patients in the middle section there are assigned to standard care, whereas the high risk patients, the dark blue and pink group, are further stratified into groups defined by the likelihood of a positive treatment response based on their biological subgroup. This has been used uh, already for a while um, by in, ex in uh, breast cancer treatment, for example, um, where a monoclonal antibody targeting the HER2 receptor in women with HER2 receptor positive breast cancer is used, but not in those with HER2 negative breast cancer. This second stratification is known as predictive enrichment. There are several advantages to this approach. If the entire group is treated similarly, not only is the likelihood of seeing a significant treatment effect of a novel therapy diluted by the low risk patients who would have had a good outcome regardless of treatment, but importantly, the risk benefit ratio of the novel treatment is higher for the low risk versus high risk patients. By differentiating between patients at high and low risk, you can uh, um, spare exposure to the low risk patient of a potentially high risk therapy. In addition, the likelihood of measuring an effect attributable to that treatment is optimized. So the power of the study can be increased and the necessary sample size can be increased, which is of course always advantageous, but especially in pediatrics. So how can these strategies be employed in studying septic shock? Since septic and septic shock are really more a syndrome with heterogeneous etiologies and responses. If we can develop more effective prognostication tools and then apply predictive environment, we can move things along a little bit faster. So it turns out that the data collected as part of the genomics in SERS project was used to, to address exactly that. Take a step back to the original genomics work. Not only were patterns of gene expression measured, which we'll get back to in a few minutes, but serum was also collected from each patient and biomarkers were measured. Based on this, the pediatric sepsis biomarker risk model, or PERSEVERE, was developed, and it uses a panel of protein biomarkers that are obtained on day one of septic shock to estimate the baseline mortality risk in children with septic shock. The biomarkers uh, that are used for this 
panel were derived from discovery-oriented gene expression profiling that identified biologically plausible biomarkers for which assays already existed. Risk stratification was developed using CART analysis. CART is classification and regression tree analysis, which is a machine learning algorithm that explains how a target variable's values can be predicted based on other values. In this case, the target variable is death, and the predictive values are the biomarker levels. These particular biomarkers all are based on differential gene expression in the original analysis. With CART analysis, patients can be stratified into high versus low risk nodes. In this case, the nodes outlined in orange are the low risk nodes. So if you look at node seven, and I don't know if you could see the numbers well enough, but only two of the 174 patients in that node died. Again, keep in mind that these are biomarker levels obtained on day one of septic shock diagnosis before much time has ensued um, and treatment, it's not treatment based. So excluding patients with a low risk of mortality would therefore prognostically enrich a study population, which becomes important in, in pediatrics, especially where the baseline risk of mortality is much lower than in adults. This is a graphical, um, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. So the, the area under the curve for this uh, for this model was 0.833, and then um, a, an updated model actually had a higher um, a higher positive uh, a higher AUC and an excellent negative predictive value. This is a graphical illustration um, of the low, intermediate, and high risk groups. And again, you can see that the um, the low risk group had nearly a hundred percent survival. The difference between this group, the persevere and persevere two, was simply the addition of using the platelet count on admission to add to the model. So it had a pretty significant effect on the accuracy. And finally there was the Persevere XP, which combined both protein and mRNA biomarkers, which further improved the prediction tool. And uh, that had a negative predictive value of 99%. So again, if you can determine who the patients are who are at lowest, lowest risk from the beginning, they can be excluded from a study. And the study is then enriched for patients who are most likely to benefit from a proposed intervention. To further refine the trial design, in addition to prognostic enrichment, you can then add techniques for predictive enrichment. So the Persevere uh, adds the prognostic enrichment and predictive rich enrichment, remember, is based on shared biological features that are not necessarily dependent on clinical phenotypic similarities. There are lots of techniques by which this can be achieved, but one of the most powerful is by looking at gene expression patterns uh, and differences, differences among patients with a particular disease or syndrome. Pivoting back to treatment guidelines for septic shock, pediatric or otherwise, it's fair to say that there remains controversy about who should and should not get steroids. Although there are many in our field who say no one should die without steroids, we don't actually have data to support that stance. So we get to look at it more. Remember that the original output of the gene expression data, which uh, looked like this. In this figure, again, individual subjects are vertical columns and the individual genes are the rows. If you take genes of interest and map each subject's level of gene expression on a grid representing those genes of interest, you get a beautiful fingerprint of sorts and patterns can be identified. And it looks like this. So in the bottom row are individual patients. In the top row are the composite expression patterns of the subclasses of patients. It's not that hard to see that there are differences between the two patients on the left and two patients on the right and the subclass A and subclass B. I remember when I first saw these graphs, um, Hector asked me to assign patients to different groups and it wasn't really hard. I felt like I was doing a Rorschach test, but, <laughs> but it wasn't really hard to distinguish who fit in which group. And the human eye was as good as sorting, at sorting as the computer was. Um, interestingly though, these patients are completely indistinguishable clinically. 
patients in uh, the subclass A, which we then uh, named endotype A, um, are patients who uh, actually have relative repression of the majority of adaptive immunity and glucocorticoid receptor signaling genes relative to the patients in subclass B. And again, these are clinically indistinguishable. The kids in endotype B, however, tended to be younger. They tended to have a, a more complicated course, which was persistent organ failure uh, after seven days or um, death. And uh, also they had a higher mortality. So there was something different about these kids. Notably in this cohort of patients, clinical care was uh, completely up to the clinical team. Um, and that included the administration of steroids. However, because the, the genes that were differentially uh, expressed had a lot to do with glucocorticoid receptor signaling and adaptive immunity, the, we thought that maybe this uh, could uh, um, illuminate some of the controversy around uh, whether steroids should be given or not. And sure enough, the group A had a four times higher risk of mortality than group B if they were given steroids. And this was independently associated with poor outcome. So there seems to be some signal here. And so maybe we should say that no patient should die with steroids. Of course, it's not that simple though. In the world of adult medicine, the guidelines for management of septic shock are more directive in favor of using steroids. Um, in case anyone in the audience thinks this increased risk of mortality is associated, associated with steroid use is unique to kids though, I'll briefly mention that an analogous endotype classification, in this case, SIRS1 or SRS1 and SRS2 has been evaluated in adults. And it turns out there's also one endotype who had significantly higher mortality if they were treated with hydrocortisone in the se setting of septic shock. This was a study in which hydrocortisone treatment was protocolized and uniform. This more than eightfold higher risk of mortality persisted after adjustment for age, sex, disease severity, and comorbidities. In this particular study, the endotypes are not the same as in the pediatric study, but it, the SRS2 group is the more immunocompetent group with a better baseline mortality risk. However, with steroid treatment, the mortality was similar to that of the already immunosuppressed SRS1 group. So maybe there was something uh, uh, particular to the SRS2 group that they were already relatively hypo-inflamed and giving them steroids was uh, uh, resulted in a negative outcome. This is still under investigation. So should patients with septic shock never get steroids, always get steroids, flip a coin? What's the right answer for the patient at whose bedside you're sitting? Well, hopefully we can answer this, uh, this question a little bit more uh, effectively in coming years um, using precision or personalized medicine and combining prognostic and predictive enrichment can inform the, the study design and the treatment. Here again, if we, if we use both prognostic and predictive enrichment, we can potentially optimize trial design. And in this table, this is looking back at all those kids with, um, the, with septic shock, dividing them into endotype A and endotype B, and looking at the relationship between the prognostic and the predictive enrichment. And it turns out that you know, the kids who, were, who had endotype B but who were at highest risk of complicated course actually had a more than tenfold reduction in complicated course with the administration of corticosteroids. Remember that the endotype B patients have a general overexpression of the adaptive immunity genes in contrast to the endotype A patients. This is again a pediatric study. It is um, the, the steroid administration was not protocolized and we need to look at it a bit more. I really need to ask Martina to help me with my graphics. I'm not a good graphic artist, but hopefully you get the idea of the hope for future state. Um, if we're able to employ prognostic and predictive enrichment using the techniques I just described, ultimately the goal of targeted treatment for pediatric septic shock might be realized. <laughs>
In order to address the specific question of steroids in septic shock, there is currently a multinational, multi-center study that has been funded in part based on the results of the Persevere Genomics work. It's called SHIPS, or Stress Hydrocortisone in Pediatric Septic Shock. And uh, we're participating on both sides of the bay. Uh, it aims to help answer the question not only of whether steroids are indicated in the treatment of septic shock, but importantly, whether with protocolized administration of steroids, we can determine whether these enrichment strategies allow for identification of which patients might benefit from steroids and which ones may be harmed by giving them steroids by looking at these biomarker-based prognostic and predictive enrichment strategies. The study opened right before COVID, so enrollment's been a little bit slow. But uh, here at UCSF, we've enrolled seven kids in this study so far on both sides of the bay. And 62 uh, patients have been um, uh, enrolled nationally. It's, the study is also going on in Canada. Salud. <laughs> um, unfortunately, a relatively common reason for exclusion has been administration of steroids in the ED prior to uh, arrival in the ICU or steroids in the ICU or on the ward prior to enrollment. So here's my plea to all the ED docs who might be listening and to all of us who care for septic shock, who are really wanting to do something. Please remember that we can't say that no one should die without steroids. We really don't know. Hopefully the study can be completed successfully. And in a few years, I can give you the answer to the question of which kids with septic shock should or shouldn't be treated with steroids with a point of care test early on in their course. In the meantime, the next iteration of this work is to develop a unified model that could predict persistent MODs and individual organ dysfunctions in children with septic shock by integrating endothelial dysfunction markers with persevere biomarkers. And there's a paper recently submitted that details that work. The goal is to use these biomarkers for prognostic enrichment of patients with a high organ dysfunction burden for future adaptive trials. There are also patents filed for point of care risk assessment, but I'm not sure of their status. And I can't finish this talk without acknowledging um, Hector Wong's work. Sadly, he passed away quite suddenly just over a year ago and uh, has left a gaping hole in the critical care community and in the world of sepsis research. But um, I just wanted to take a moment to honor and thank Hector, whose vision, mentorship, and friendship was largely responsible for why I'm sitting here today and the way that my career has gone, along with all my other friends and colleagues. Um, but his passion for clinical care and the refinement of precision medicine to bring questions from the bench to the bedside and back to the bench has informed much of the work in sepsis across the world. He was also a fierce advocate for underserved communities and promoted DEI initiatives for students and faculty. His untimely death has left an immeasurable void, but I'm confident we can carry on his work. May he rest in peace. So other collaborations that have been really interesting and productive and have included being an ongoing participant in the Policy Network, um, which uh, with project projects ranging from nutrition interventions in critical illness to being part of the quickly mobilized and comprehensive effort to understand COVID, uh, immunobiology and vaccine effectiveness and the impact on uh, kids long-term. It's been really great joining forces with Pat Patrick McQuillan and expanding the PICU research group here at UCSF. And one of the studies listed here, the PRECISE study, is another investigation that's an example of the pursuit of personalized medicine. And I'm going to put a plug in for it because it's really interesting and complicated. And we just got it off the ground here in um, San Francisco and Oakland. So uh, PRECISE is a trial funded by the NICHD, and UCSF has contributed significantly to the preliminary data. It incorporates precision medicine to assess immunomodulatory therapies and multi-organ dysfunction related to septic shock. And um, in this case, the personalization is with regard to which type of immune dysregulation is present in subjects. We know that with critical illness and sepsis in particular, there's a spectrum of immune responses ranging from overly exuberant inflammation to immunoparalysis. By measuring the early host response to sepsis with ferritin levels as a marker for inflammation and TNF alpha levels as a marker for immunoparalysis or surrogate, patients are allocated to immune modulating therapy with GCSF for immune stimulation or anakinra, an IL-2 receptor antagonist for immunosuppression. 
if patients are neither hyperinflamed nor uh, immunosuppressed, they're simply observed. And if they're wildly hyperinflamed, we pass them off to HEMONC for HLH treatment. <laughs> Uh, this study has just gotten off the ground, um, and uh, we just are live here uh, at UCSF in the last uh, week. <laughs> and um, we're excited to be participating on, on both sides of the bay um, as part of this collaborative. So, so what does it take for a clinical research career to be successful? It takes a heck of a lot of teamwork, excellent mentorship, a little luck but really finding something that's interesting and will expose you to a wide variety of avenues is key. Don't worry, imposter syndrome may never go away. But if you can look back and know that you've played a part in making children's lives better, there's nothing false about that. John F. Kennedy said, we must find a time to stop and thank those who made a difference in our lives. And thank you for the opportunity to do so here. It's really taken a team Mike Dean, so many years ago, introduced me to the field of pediatric critical care and mentored me in Salt Lake City. I got here uh, to the Bay Area and was fortunate to meet our critical care group with Jim Hansen, Heidi Flory, all my friends at CCCMG, which was our private critical care group before we integrated. Julie Simon and Mary McElroy were research nurses who were uh, amazing colleagues and partners. Jeff Feynman, Patrick, and Sean, and Matt Zinter and the whole PICU research group, our current research coordinators, all the fabulous PICU fellows, past, present, and future, the PICU nurses, and of course, Hector Wong. And a truly great mentor is hard to find, difficult to part with, and impossible to forget. And I count my blessings. Thank you very much. overview and um, so much knowledge. I heard the talk before and I learned more things again. Um, are there any questions from the audience here? I have some questions from the webinar audience, but if it, questions here. Well, you think about it. That's the million dollar question, <laughs> right? So, so the, um, I mean, that's a debate both in the adult and um, pediatric world. And um, there's a lot, a lot of work going into it. And we just, we really don't know the answer. Um, Yeah, it seems contradictory, um, but but there are some patients in whom they seem to help and some patients in whom they seem to be harmful, and we're trying to sort that out because we can't distinguish them clinically, certainly not at the beginning. Um, Dr. Ron Kleiman actually has a question that uh, sort of relates to that. In newborns, the response to hydrocortisone and toxicity from hydrocortisone treatment varies with the baseline cortisol levels prior to steroid administrations. Um, high pre-treatment cortisol, the babies do worse than um, compared to those who have low levels. Do we have any information about baseline cortisol and response to treatment in pediatric septic patients? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's a great one. And it turns out that um, measuring cortisol levels prior to the steroid administration does not actually help inform whether they're going to be harmful or, or helpful. So stay tuned. Maud. Thank you for the great talk. Um, in my experience as a pediatric intensivist, I've rarely met a picky doctor that didn't have an opinion about cortical steroids. And so how do you manage equipoise in this research? You don't. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, that's a really hard question to answer. And it's hard for any study where people feel strongly. Um, and you're right, we all have opinions. And can I sit at the bedside of a 15 year old with influenza and staph aureus super infection who's 
wildly septic and, you know, I've thrown everything at her and can I resist the impulse to give her steroids? Should I resist the impulse to give her steroids? I don't know. Um, but that's the point of the study. And um, hopefully we can try to be as intellectually honest as possible. Um, Dr. Jim Padbury asks, I think this is in relationship to the SHIPS trial. Are longitudinal analyses to identify early divergence of groups being carried out to minimize risk of group assignment? So I, this it came up when you discussed the SHIPS trial, and I think it's about the, um, the pre-assignment of whether you're in a high-risk or a low-risk group. Yeah, I, I'm so just to be clear, the the ships trial, the the assignment of group has nothing to do with the biomarker profile, so that's still being investigated as part of this the trial. So the trial is randomized. Um, uh, uh, it's just it's randomized independent of any biomarker profile. Um, so I think the yeah the the next trial will hopefully address that. So if if we're able to get to where we have a point of care test or a test that can be done quickly in order to then help randomization, um, that may be the next iteration. Does the, I'm forgetting all the acronyms. Are the, is it the GRACE one, the G, GMCSF and the, and the Anna Kinra one? Is the same question for that? Like if somebody progresses after randomization to a different category of, of level of inflammation based on their ferritin? Like, do we, are we adjusting the, the intervention for them? No, I don't yeah. think so. No, no it's, it's really at the beginning. Yeah. I can't remember the frequency with which ferritin levels are checked, but if if the ferritin got crazy high, then you know the that's part of the safety uh, evaluation of the of the trial. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, I have the benefit of coming to Grand Rounds every week, so I see these patterns in 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 uh, different research paradigms. And you started your um, talk about why do certain kids get sick and others don't get so sick. And I think this work really points towards what children, what, what, the, what the characteristics are, but maybe not so much yet to the why. We heard a talk last week about um, people who are uh, asymptomatic with uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and their HLA typing. And so is there an aspect of all this work that actually also looks at like whether there are particularly genomic profiles that make people more or less susceptible to get sick so that we, I don't know what we would do with it, but yeah. maybe put them in a bubble or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and I think um, the, this genomic analysis looks at the gene expression patterns as a result of a particular situation. So it doesn't, it's different than a genetic study. But yes, is there some sort of fingerprint of endotype A that says from the beginning, you know, you, you are more susceptible because of whichever pattern you showed up with. So looking at the controls and following them over time would be an interesting way to, to approach that. And I don't know whether that work is being done. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, no, just uh, uh, no, thank you. That's really interesting work. Um, I was just curious. Um, I assume that early differential genomics work was on uh, bulk PBMCs, would be my guess. Do you know, is there ongoing work to further differentiate uh, differential expression with any um, single cell RNA seq where you actually can look at the different patterns of specific? Um, white blood cells and and see if there might be a little more information into the why. Um, I think that there is work going on in that um, regard. The this body of work was um, purposely more uh, practically intended 
because the the sampling is really easy to do the processing is really easy to do and so yes that's clearly important to do this was again sort of a, a hypothesis generating approach um so yeah i i'm i'm sure that there are people i don't know um from hector's program um that anybody is looking at it in in those specifics all right, well, we're past the hour, so I'm going to read the last thing that uh, is on here, which is Dr. Uh, Liz Rogers, who says, such a great ta talk. Thank you so much. And I echo that. And thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, we'll see you all next week for uh, Grand Rounds. <laughs> <laughs>